Well, in this podcast, we have the privilege of uh, talking with and getting to know and learning from Gary Thomas. Uh, Gary is a a pastor, the teaching pastor at Cherry Hills Church in uh, in Colorado. Uh, He is an author who's written many, many books uh, that have impacted my life and my ministry. Uh, He has also become a friend through the years, and he and his wife Lisa are friends with Sherry uh, and I, and also with with the the church here at Shoreline Church. Um, And so uh, he's also a, a... uh, a husband, a dad, a grandpa, and uh, and somebody who just loves and serves Jesus. And so I'm looking forward to this conversation. He also lives in the real world doing ministry uh, where he's in the world of social media, of writing, of traveling, of speaking. And when you're in the real world and you're doing great things for God, you can end up with a target on your back. And so as we talk about toxic people dealing with um, just the toxicity of our age, uh, I know that, that Gary speaks not only out of study and watching other people's lives, but knowing what it's like to come under the weight of that and have to navigate it and figure it out. And I know as you listen to Gary, you'll discover he's not coming as someone who's figured it all out. He's still learning along the way. And so, uh, Gary, welcome uh, to the podcast. Uh, it's a Kevin. privilege to be with you and, and to call you a friend um, and to have this time to talk together. So uh, first, tell me, what was it that, cause you to say, I'm going to devote a chunk of my time of my life to dig into a topic that honestly, uh, most wise and sane people would avoid. <laughs> so uh, what, there, something must have pushed or prompted or happened. What, what, what brought you to yeah. that point? Well, look, I was the least likely person to deal with this. It doesn't play to my strengths. It actually plays to my weaknesses, mm-hmm. but that's what caused the birth of the book. Isn't that what God often does? Yeah. Brings things out of our weaknesses. Um, and I wish I would have had this book 30 years ago, to be yeah. honest. It, yeah. it would have so changed my life and ministry. But I was in a situation with a clearly toxic person, a really good friend of mine, a marriage and family therapist who knew the situation. Mm-hmm. I, and I found out I had been lied about and undercut and all mm-hmm. of these awful things. And I just thought, why? I'm, mm-hmm. I'm just not even worth it. I, I don't yeah. get it. And so I went to my friend, I want to respond like a believer. How do yeah. I honor God? How do I approach this? Mm-hmm. And he was the one that shocked me and said, I, I just think you should let it go. And I said, mm. how could that be what Christ would have us do? And that's when he pointed me to the Gospel of Luke. Count how many times Jesus walked away from someone mm. or how many times others walked away from him and Jesus didn't give chase. Mm. And, and so I went through it and it's just, Kevin, I can't count the number of times I've read the New Testament. I started yeah. when I was eight. I yeah, just turned yeah. 60. Yeah. So, um, but it was amazing to me how these blinders fell off and I saw it because I would have always thought one instance like that was a failure on my yeah. part. I don't believe Jesus could ever fail. So then yeah. I realized, okay, I just have been reading this with, with blinders and yeah. it just opened up a whole new world. And I mm. thought it would be a short book and not a lot of scripture and it ended up being much longer and may have more scripture than any book I've read. There's hmm. so much in scripture about it yeah. that I just didn't see before. And and when you think about that, you'd read the Bible through many times. It's not as you've walked down that road and studied it, it's not it's not a a small topic and not even a subtle one. And so why why do you think you missed that? What why if if it's there, was there some predisposition in your own thinking that kept you from noticing what seems to have been obvious now? Yeah, I, I, th- I think we all probably deal with that with different issues. Mm-hmm. But, I, you know, I've mentioned how Matthew 6.33 is a life verse. Seek first the kingdom of God. Go on the offense. Always be reaching out. Yeah. Always loving. Mm-hmm. And I just like that message. Yeah. I mean, even the title mm-hmm. of Bob Goss books, always, uh, well, everybody always. Love yeah. everybody yeah. always. Even though he, he begins that book talking, or, or love does, about he's not talking about toxic people, but that's the kind of book I would like to write. That's yeah. the kind of book that yeah. inspires me. You can love yeah. you. Your love can break through. But six verses after, um, Matthew six thirty three is Jesus saying, don't give what is holy to dogs hmm. or cast your pearl before swine or else I'll turn and tear you to pieces. And I, I just, I think I just skipped over it, to be yeah, honest, yeah. like we do. Well, it didn't really fit with yeah. what gets me excited. Yeah. And, and it was a good lesson that if I want to be more like Jesus, I have to be less like Gary. Yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> sometimes I think we read the Bible through the lens of, I like this, this is good, I'm going to yeah. emphasize that. But we've got to let the Bible set the agenda for what yeah. we speak about, what yeah. we care about, how we act, not just what naturally fits us or not even naturally what we like because our tastes are disordered. Um, so it was a life experience to be sure, hmm. to see my blind spots yeah. and to have them brought out into the light. And you almost you almost don't want to notice that Jesus is using harsh language, you know, 
dogs, pearls before swine. It's like, well, it can't mean that. Right. And uh, and I've had the privilege of reading your book, and then uh, Sherry and I had the the honor of working with you on creating a small group, you know, curriculum to go with it. So we got to really dig into it. And uh, my disposition has always been a little bit more towards the um, maybe a little more skeptical and uh, not as optimistic as your outlook. I became a Christian, you know, further down in life. I didn't grow up in a Christian home, but, um, but, but you also want to picture Jesus always tender, always caring, always loving and miss the fact that sometimes the most loving thing to do is actually to walk away or deal with the tough things. And so um, in, in our current, you know, secular culture, which has become very polarized and even in the church, um, it seems to me that this book is, unfortunately becoming more and more relevant yeah. uh, and more and more needed. Uh, we had a gather here at Shor a gathering at Shoreline church and had a, a, just a great group of people who came. I think every person in that room, uh, every person in the worship center, I think came with not just a curiosity about a topic, but a, a personal existential uh, reality that they were facing a person trying to, figure, are they toxic? Are they not? What is it in our world right now that I think makes this topic even more urgent or critical for Christians to think about? Well, I think as we race from God, we race toward godlessness and ungodliness. And every statistic I'm reading talks about less people identify as believers, yeah. uh, less people are attending church. And, and frankly, a world without God is a world where we lose the I think the boundaries over the bad things we do and we lose the power to be the people that we want to be and that God wants us to be. Yeah. But it's not just that, because I think even in the church, there are those that are acting clearly toxic. Yeah. Dallas Willard addressed this, though, 25 years ago when he had this question, why are Christians so mean? Hmm. Was a he goes, look, I look around. Why would we be mean of all people? Mm -hmm. You look at... So many, you know, you preached on Ephesians 4. Last night I used Colossians 3. Every one of Paul's epistles just about has these lists of you shouldn't be giving your way over to anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language, lying. You should be putting on compassion, kindness, patience. A couple words change here or there. But yeah. he rarely fails to say this isn't what we were to be and this is yeah. what we are. Dallas Willard's answer was we care more about being right than we care more about being like Christ. Hmm. Yeah. And I, I think that's what we see is that people that are sort of disqualifying their message yeah. by the way they speak it, by the way they, they lie about it. They want to uh, take people down. And I've seen a fascinating study where people that assassinate others online, their goal mm -hmm. is to get them down. It's the same dopamine hit that hunters get when they're out mm. bringing down a buck or an elk wow. or a moose or something like yeah. that. It's like they're not really after reconciliation. Mm. They're not after correction. They're after yeah. a trophy. Yeah. We brought him down. We brought yeah. her down. Yeah. Yay. Now, who's the next one? Um, and th that is so against yeah. the cause of Christ, yeah. the nature of Christ. It's so yeah. dangerous. Then, then your mission becomes destruction. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 We become yeah. exactly what Jesus says we shouldn't be in Matthew 7, when yeah. he says, do not judge lest you yeah. be judged. We don't live with mercy as the fundamental aspect of yeah. our life. We yeah. live as, you're not as good as me, you're not as correct as me, you're not as precise yeah. as me, yeah. therefore you shouldn't exist. And all the while waving the banner of Jesus over our head, That's saying, I'm the, one, I'm the one who's more like Jesus as I destroy, uh, <laughs> just, just as, as I leave just rubble behind me. And even, even if if there's times where somebody is wrong and needs to be needs to be addressed and corrected, uh, I think biblically that off you know that correct correction should start with grace and yeah. truth, but grace. And there seems to be this graceless antagonism. And uh, but pa yeah. Paul's very clear, Galatians six one. Yeah. If anyone among you should sin, yeah. those of you who are spiritual, mm -hmm. which you know is a metaphor for mature. Yeah. If you're mature, you should restore him gently. Yes. Paul did that, and. Um, what scares me is the way that people come alive when somebody sins because yeah. it gives them <laughs> something a, to attack. A, a platform to, for their anger. They yeah. really come alive yeah. when they're doing their worst. Yeah, yeah. One of the things I love about the book and I love about, about how you kind of expound the biblical concepts is that you actually are far more concerned 
about what we're walking toward than what we're walking away from. Uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, you don't thank spend you. the whole book saying, here's why people are bad and toxic, let's get away from them. You, you help Christians who don't realize the biblical nature of that journey. But what you seem to be really about, and I want you to address this, is you're about people not being so bound up with the toxic people and consumed with the triage and the fixing and the struggling and the guilt and the fear and all those things and being unleashed to do what you said before, to seek first the kingdom, to be what God wants them to be. Uh, just say a little bit about just how, how the idea of when to walk away, you know, getting away from toxic people is not primarily about getting away from toxic people. It's be about becoming who God wants you to be. Yeah. Uh, William Grinnell wrote about this several hundred years ago, where it's easier to keep flies out of the pantry in the summer than Satan's servants from distracting and stealing a Christian's joy and peace. Uh, and you say, well, why is that? Well, Satan doesn't want us to do the positive work. Yeah. He knows that we are compelled to love by the Spirit. If we have yeah. an authentic relationship with God as we meet with Him, He's yeah. so filled with love, it fills out. Of, we we yeah. want to love people. So if Satan can steal our joy with a toxic person, the joy of the Lord is our strength, that makes us weak. Yeah. If he can steal our confidence, we're not going to speak up. Yeah. Man, I, maybe I don't know what is right. Maybe I am wrong. Yeah. That doesn't seem right to me, but yeah. they make it sound like it should be. And, I, and, and so it just immobilizes us. And so if someone is haunting you, I'm not just as, look, I am concerned that you're being haunted. I don't want you to, I want you to live in peace. But it also means you're not dreaming God, who can I reach? My neighbor, how do I pray? I, it's one thing that just really hit me as a woman who was online being attacked mercilessly. Mm -hmm. And so she's spending all of it. How do I respond? What do I do? What do I do this or that and whatnot? And then one of her good friends came up. Hey, how did your husband's uh, presentation go? He had this big thing at work. Mm -hmm. And she realized. Oh, she missed it. Yeah. I didn't pray about it. Yeah. I didn't ask him about it. Mm -hmm. And she goes, I've let these angry yeah. people mm -hmm. take me away from being the wife yeah. Yeah. I want to be. That's mm -hmm. what I'm concerned yeah. about yeah. because it's it's not just what it did. Then she's like, it was a real wake up call mm -hmm. for her. I've got to walk away from these people or I'm not going to do the good work mm -hmm. God has called me yeah. to do. And then, I, and I think it's just an aspect of defense. Mm -hmm. I'm never more tempted to be toxic than when I'm dealing with toxic people. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's fair yeah. to say I can't win that mm -hmm. game, so I'm not going to play it. Yeah. I would never yeah. go up to Le LeBron James and say, "All right, we're going to play thousand dollars game of twenty one. You know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> then I'm going to double down. He beats me. Yeah. I'm going to. At a certain point, you realize I can't win this game, so <laughs> maybe I shouldn't chance. play it. Yeah. And and maybe somebody who has a PhD in psychology or in logic or is just more secure than I am, like I can handle this person, and it's not going. But mm -hmm. if you recognize you can't yeah. and sometimes just don't get into yeah. the game i, I love yeah. the way that that frank viola put it one time if you're in a tug of war with somebody that's not healthy drop the rope yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that will frustrate them more than anything because yeah. they want to fight yeah. and when you say i'm not going to be a part of it that actually can make them angrier yeah yeah what is it this this is spec you know, spec i'm asking you to speculate and try to fear what is it that that would cause some christ people who bear the name of jesus who i think you know, have come to the cross and received Jesus. They understand the gospel. They they try to orient their life around the word of God, but they feel this ongoing compulsion to attack, 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 not not correct gently, not, I mean, it, I, I'm not saying if you have a concern not to raise it, but the, that the spirit in which they do it just seems continually harsh and combative. How can someone keep living that way and and really claim this is, I'm doing this in the name and the spirit of Jesus. How, how does that work? Well, it's impossible if they look at it logically. Jesus yeah. said, all men will know you are my disciples, this is John 13, if, if, if you have love for one, for one another. Yeah. Yeah. And if you've learned to have love, you know this, Kevin, you have given generously. There is a thrill that comes from generosity mm -hmm. that would be the polar opposite of defrauding someone. Yeah. There is a settledness that comes from peace. I was working with a man because he saw me just hand Lisa my phone and my iPad for something. And he said, you know, I went for years because of my addictions. I couldn't let my phone or iPad be seen by my kids or my wife. Mm. What if they see it? He had yeah. no peace in his life. Yeah. And, and, and 
if you could understand what encouraging someone does, you see somebody break through and be lifted up, it's so much more fun than malice or tearing them down and making them feel small. I just don't think they've tasted the good life. Yeah. Um, and so what I think they're driven by is selfish ambition. I know mm -hmm. one person, their books just didn't sell very well. Mm -hmm. They had a number of books that would sell some thousands of copies, but nothing special. Yeah. Decided to go on to an attack doubled their online presence because mm -hmm. anger draws people. Yeah. But what this person found is that if you draw people by attacking, you have to keep attacking mm. <laughs> to keep your followers because yeah. that's yeah. why they're following you. And yeah. so that's what they have to do. They mm. have to find somebody new yeah. to attack. And it's like they get yeah. excited. This is what's just, Kevin, this is what's so awful. They get excited when somebody else messes up because now they're gonna keep drawing their thing and they can pile on. But it's yeah. worked in sales for their yeah. books. So yeah. there yeah. you go. And you know, that's very much the case in, in a lot of the social media world and the secular world. Uh, what a heartbreaking thing that that has now leaked into and taken hold in the Christian world. Yeah. And I, I think that, that having people who are scholarly and know the scriptures and who will in the appropriate way address concerns with with leaders and pastors and and authors and and uh, christian you know christian personalities whoever uh to raise those things in the right way is is a good thing but if it becomes this bottomless pit this monster you have to keep feeding um then you know then what they ought to do is turn their sights on themselves for a while and actually question themselves and maybe do a whole <clears throat> a whole series of uh, going back at their own their own posts and their own things and say you know what i'm going to call myself to the carpet here i'm going to mm -hmm. humbly say wouldn't that be something would that would, would, wouldn't that be a powerful thing if somebody who had been sucked into that would then just stop and do a whole expose on themselves in their own ministry i i'm not waiting for it i'm not expecting it but that, that would be pretty cool I, um I was just so blessed to be a student of Dr. J.I. Packers, who was a wonderful man, a great scholar. And I think the way he disagreed taught me, even in seminary, what to do. He had a great book, Keep in Step with the Spirit. Mm -hmm. He was famous for not being a fan of charismatics, yeah. but he was so gracious about it. What I loved, he did, Kevin, he says, okay, he began with this. This is what we can learn from charismatics. Mm -hmm. And this is what I think charismatics can learn from us. Hmm. It's brilliant. Yeah. He, he acknowledges it. And it's uh, it's ironic. It's it's yeah. peaceful. It's not attacking. He's yeah. just and and I think that's that's what honors Christ. Mm -hmm. But trying to crush your enemy or defeat your enemy is just um, one. How is God behind that? God either wants the Christian to be restored gently, yep. or if they're not a Christian, he wants a Christian to treat them in a way that Christ is attractive, so they'll consider yeah. the claims yeah. of Christ. Yeah. But going after a spiritual assassination does neither. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we'll hope and, hope and pray that that becomes less, less and less the thing in the, in the, in the Christian church. Um, what are some of the potential consequences if a person is in a truly toxic relationship, but they just don't want to acknowledge it. They're like, if I if I ignore it, it'll go away. If I if I close my eyes, it'll all get better. Right. Um, what? Where's that going to lead? Where where potentially could that lead? Yeah. There's a famous marathon, 1982, the Boston Marathon. It's been called the Duel in the Sun. Alberto Salazar ran against Dick Beardsley. They were going back and forth, back and forth. And back then, this is 40 years ago. They didn't realize how important water and hydration is and whatnot. And Alberto, I believe ran his kidneys into permanent damage. Wow. And he never really recovered from that race. It took years and doctors started to figure back what was going on and, and figured out that the damage he did in that one race that he may never really fully recover from. But they started to make him feel better. And he had this line that answers your question. I didn't realize how sick I was until I started to feel better. Mm. It's like he had to get a little bit better to say, that was really mm -hmm. sick, the mm -hmm. way I felt. And I think relationally we get that. Some people yeah. can get in a marriage and they don't realize how sick it is. It is sick if you wake up every day feeling demeaned. It is sick if there's abuse. It is sick if you're enemies instead of lovers. It is sick if you're being controlled and feel like you're in a prisoner in a relationship. Now, here's the thing. A prison can start to feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. A headache can start to feel normal. That doesn't mean a prison or a headache are good things. It's just we learn to accommodate them. And I would say find a healthy situation where you can start to feel healthy again and look back and say, 
I, I need not just to walk. I need to flee from that, not walk away. I need to run away. That's not good. That's not how I thrive. It. I, I just ask, is this leading me to enthusiastic worship? Mm-hmm. Is this leading me to peace? Is this leading me to joy? Is it leading me to healthy relationships? Mm-hmm. Is it leading me to love? Do I live by grace and mercy? If those things aren't true, there's sickness involved in that relationship mm-hmm. and you need to think about, yeah. you know what, I, I just do it. But, you know, it's like, just another analogy. A doctor friend of mine was a marathoner and he had a guy that was not doing well at all. And he finally said, we gotta have the talk. And he goes, if you keep living the way you do, you're not gonna make it. And so he said, can you give up the smoking? And the guy said, you know what, I, I, need, the, I need the nicotine hit. I work long days. He goes, all right, well, can you put in some exercise? He goes, you're, you're way over, he goes, I, I can't, I just don't have the time. I can't leave to exercise when I'm asking everybody else to work 12 hours a day. He goes, well, how mm-hmm. about the alcohol you're having, you're drinking way too much. Well, mm-hmm. that's sort of my, helping me cope at the, in the evening. He goes, well, then at least give me up the bowl of ice cream every night. And the guy says, that's my one reward. I work this crazy day. <laughs> and, and then the doctor finally said, and kudos to this doctor, he goes, then you need to prepare to die. If you've accepted that this is going to get you through the day, mm-hmm. it's going to end your days. And mm-hmm. I think sometimes in relationally we say, well, I need to let this person do this to me and I don't want to offend them and I'm going to do this and it would be too hard to confront that person. And then, you, well, then you just need to basically prepare to, to die relationally mm-hmm. and emotionally and spiritually because you're allowing yeah. these t- toxins and poisons to come into your yeah. life you can only handle it for so long and i think yeah. a lot of times we overestimate how long we do so we better learn to identify toxic people we we better be ready to take some steps away from them if not fully walking away and i and i would encourage people to pick up your book and read it because it you you give a great pathway for that but you know there's some people in our life that are are broken they're just hurting there's some people in our life that are are tough people but there's some people that are toxic and and, you know tough could be maybe be irritating and broken people maybe need you need some maybe a broken person can become toxic but if they're just broken they need compassion but toxic people you better learn to walk away or figure out a way around them what are like three or four of the top indicators that somebody says okay you know i can read the book for all the details but what are like the three or four things that would be the most kind of obvious that, that this person is going beyond being kind of broken and hurting or difficult to being a, actually a toxic person that, I, that, that can be dangerous in my life. Yeah. Let me give a principle before I get there because it's I'm, I'm quoting you. I thought it was real helpful because I'll talk about the gentleness of Jesus and somebody will say, what about clearing the temple? Hmm. I'll talk about uh, walking away from toxic people as Jesus. And well, what about when Jesus said, you know, turn the other cheek? Yeah. You used a great analogy that I wish I remembered last night. I remembered you'd written a chapter, I forgot the line, where you said sometimes Paul would declare Roman citizenship to avoid being hit, and other times he would undergo the persecution. And so there there aren't hard and fast rules for this. Paul didn't apply them that way, and and we have to do it. I, I think the way we determine that, whether it's hurting or toxic, is... Are they taking pieces out of us? Now, Hmm. it's okay to have a little bit. You know that ministry can be draining, relationships can be draining, but if they're completely undercutting your joy and peace and confidence so that you can't do what God has called you to do, you can't be the spouse that God has called you to be. Like this woman, she couldn't try to fight these people online and be there for her husband. Or uh, a a father who recognizes, I'm so overwhelmed by what's happening at work and trying to figure out the craziness. My kids are yanking on my legs. Dad, 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 are you even listening Mm. to me? Or I can't sit down to pray or meditate because I'm just haunted by thoughts and feelings and anger about what this person is doing. So I would just say, look at the effect. Yeah. Is it haunting you? Is it taking you away from worship Mm -hmm. and service and outreach and healthy relationships, then at that point you realize, okay, it's gone too far. And and it's okay to say at some points, I, I don't have what you need from me right now, yeah. even if they're just troubled. I was really set free by, a, again, a, a counselor friend of mine who said, Gary, if somebody came to you as a pastor and said, Pastor, I, I need a root canal, um, but I don't have any money. I've been unemployed, you know, for three months. Mm-hmm. 
but I believe you're a man of God. And I, I brought some... <laughs> <laughs> some <laughs> medical tools here and I just I just believe the spirit will guide you I'd like you to perform my root canal he goes you wouldn't even consider you think no. this is absolutely crazy he goes Gary you're not a PhD in psychology yeah. if you're dealing with a truly narcissistic or in some sense even evil or certain mm -hmm. really troublesome personalities it's not against it's not a retreat to say I just don't have what you need right now. Yeah. I can't be what you want me to be. Yeah. I wish I could. I'm yeah. not. I need to be in my uh, wheelhouse. And so yeah. it's recognizing that God has called us to do some things. Mm -hmm. God hasn't called me to be a senior pastor. Now, yeah. if a church was in a crisis and somebody says, Gary, for a month, can you hold the ship while we do that? Mm -hmm. I hope that never would come up, but then mm -hmm. you might, do, but you're trying to get out of that as soon as you can. I think it's the same thing relationally know your skill set and if you're yeah. over your head in a relationship yeah. figure out how to get out of it as soon yeah. as you can so yeah. that as we said yeah. earlier mm -hmm. you can fully give yourself over yeah. to the gifts that god has yeah. called you to yeah it is what this is taking from me you know killing me <laughs> destroying me is what is being in the orbit of this person um am i helping them Am I even help, you know? I don't have the medical expertise to help that person, but they keep demanding that I do, and so it's draining me. It's not helping them. Where's the upside, right? And and then what's it keeping me from actually doing that would honor God and that would that would have, give me a sense of purpose and meaning in this world that is consistent with what Jesus wants? I mean, although yeah. So so again, I love what you're you're not just talking about what they do wrong. You're talking about how what God wants you to do right, how He wants you to live your life, and. And so in a sense, and I'm not going to put words in your mouth, but I listen to this as a, as a local church pastor, um, a toxic person, Satan will use any tool he can to mess with people. But a toxic person can be the very thing that keeps us from fulfilling the mission, the calling, the vision God has for our lives because we're spending all our time on someone we that that drains us, that we'll never, that we can't fix, and that we may not even be called to help, but we can That's just so. get sucked in. So, so why don't we see it? Why, why, why would I, yeah. I, I shared last night at our, our gathering we had here that I had a friend through college and through my young adult years that when I moved out of town, I was kind of glad because I wasn't around him anywhere. Because whenever I was with him, he would, it was something negative, something critical, something bad about other people. And I just left him feeling dirty and, and depleted and discouraged and other D words, I guess. But I'm just like, I just like, I just, despondent, so, so when I despondent, despairing, yeah. <laughs> and so when I moved out of the state, I was kind of like, oh, that's great. Um, I don't have to really deal with them a whole lot anymore. But when I would go back, about every other time I'd go back to California to visit, and I was living in Michigan at the time, I'd drop him a note and check in on him because I felt bad. He didn't have very many friends. Um, he didn't have much of a life, really, honestly. And so I'd feel bad for him. So I keep putting, and then every time I'd go, get around him, it'd do the same thing. Yeah. Why, why would I... When I moved out of state. Why don't I just let it go? What is it that drives us to to want to help people who probably don't even want to be helped or, or to love people who don't want to be loved or to keep pointing to people who suck the life out of us? Why do we... You have to have thought about this. Yeah, Why do we keep doing it? I have. There's a good reason and there's a bad reason. The bad reason was me. I think there was some arrogance. Hmm. I can be the person God uses to break through. Yep, yep. I loved reading the biography of Frank Buckman. He was a founder of Moral Rearmament a powerful one-on-one -on -one ministry in the early part of the 20th century, amazing breakthroughs. He was the kind of guy that people would spend an hour with and their life would be changed hmm. and he would hear from God. And that was sort of my view. Oh, I'm going to have the word from the Lord. I'm going to be... Gonna and, fix and, him right up. Yeah. And, and, and so I think there was that arrogant, I, I, without mm -hmm. a humble, maybe I'm not the person to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there's a good reason, Kevin, and I'm sure this is true for you. You have an evangelist heart. You have a good heart. You're just thinking, mm -hmm. I hate to just let this person go. But here's the thing where I think will help us, those of you with a good heart, <laughs> do that, is we don't want to get in the way of a person's consequences if consequences are what God is using to soften them, to open yeah. them up to conviction. Yeah. And so... Uh, it was the case I shared last night of a mother whose daughter was clearly toxic, adult daughter, would always get in trouble. She would cancel teaching Bible studies, cancel dates with her husband. She would cancel mentoring relationships she had that were really healthy to save her daughter because her daughter said, you know, I'm, I'm going to be destitute tonight if you don't mm -hmm. come. Mm -hmm. And after 10 years, woke up and said, okay, she's not any better, mm -hmm. and I've lost so much ministry. Yeah. And maybe if she would have let her daughter face the consequences yeah. instead of rescuing her, 
yeah. her daughter would have had to come mm -hmm. to grips with what she was doing earlier. So I think there's good motivation. She had a good motivation. She cared, but sometimes well-intentioned people can do damage and, mm -hmm. and we don't want to do that. We've just got to trust mm -hmm. the Holy Spirit is at work. The Holy Spirit is authoring this person's salvation and, and we don't want to get in the way. I'm not saying that we can, but certainly we don't mm -hmm. even want to delay it. Yeah. Um, so just search our motives. Sometimes yeah. it can be good. Sometimes it can be bad. Yeah. Yeah. It was interesting in this relationship I, I talked about. I, um, when I met him in college, he was going to be getting married right out of college and he asked me to be in his wedding and it was just his brother and me. And it, 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 it struck <laughs> me. I, I, I thought he considers me one of his, one of his closest friends or the, the only friend that will actually show up. And, and so how many weddings would you have had to have to invite him to be in the wedding party? I don't want to be unkind, but it'd be, it'd be 50 <laughs> plus. I mean, yeah, it, it, he wasn't that, we weren't that close. Yeah, yeah. We weren't that close. And, but I said to my wife, one of the times we we're going to go back to California, I said, I, I got to give this guy a ring and, and just see how he's doing. And, and, and I said, wait, I said, you know what? I said, if I think if I don't reach out to him and call him, I may never hear from him again. Because it's sort of a one-sided relationship. And so I made a decision to just wait until to interact with him when he reached out to me. It's been over 20 years. <laughs> and so, uh, and so you know, I think that maybe we sometimes put ourselves into those situations where we could actually simply, we didn't have to walk away. We just have to not reach out again. And they may walk away from us. But if they don't, we have got to learn those skills of walking away. And but so, Kevin, yeah. how many Bible studies have you written in the last 20 years? 20 years, we sure and I write four a year, so 80 Bible studies. And and how many yeah. sermons have you preached? And young men have you yeah. counseled yeah. and mentored? And that's Way the better it's, investment in my life, right? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And look, every time I get your voice coming through, it's just it's just this wonderful experience with Jesus. So, um, yeah. yeah, I think it was a, a wise yeah. thing yeah. just to reallocate your time. Yeah. And and by God's grace, I have other friends. In the, in the last 20 years, you and I become friends. And every time we talk on the phone, every time we pray, every time we interact, and it's not, it's not, it's, it's every couple months, you know, but I leave that, that time refreshed, encouraged, and more equipped to live the way God wants me to yeah. live, not less equipped. Mm -hmm. And so, and so, and ultimately then you say, well, then if this is for the glory of God, then I maybe have to deal with those tough decisions to, to draw those boundaries. And so, um, I want to encourage people to to read your book. If they're in a small group context, do the small group with, uh, study. It'll be um, valuable in their lives. What what will your be your kind of parting words for somebody who's listening and saying, "Boy, I want to I want to take some steps. Just just I want to take a couple steps into either understanding this topic or maybe starting to distance from somebody who's a toxic person." What would be like? first baby steps because people are it's nerve-wracking and oh, it's, it's it's a family member it's a friend it's um what are a couple steps to start moving down that road it's difficult to say no if you don't have a more powerful yes hmm. so get a vision of how god wants to use you i think yeah. you, you kind of touch on this in your book no is a beautiful word that if you have a rightly ordered life it's yeah. easier to spot okay this isn't the best use of my time and yeah. i want to use that word best not, is this an acceptable use? Yeah. Is this the best use of my time? You do want to have time to reach hurting people. You yeah. want to have time to reach out strangers. Maybe God is working. And I do pray, Kevin, God, would there be uh, these divine moments where I'm not planning, where you bring somebody in my path so I can be there um, for them. But if my mind is preoccupied trying to figure out this craziness or I'm being gaslit or I'm being yeah. haunted, then I'm not open for that. So I would just say, Go on the offense first. What has God called you to do? Are you engaged in healthy relationships? Are you connecting with friends on a regular basis? We we need to double down on friends yeah, yeah. in this day and age. Yeah. Um, are you giving yourself over to your marriage and your family and the calling that God has given you? Um, then out of that, you can evaluate. I don't need to feel guilty. If I'm doing all I can to seek first the kingdom of God, Matthew 6, 33, there's no guilt if... I don't think this is the best way to seek first God's kingdom. Yeah. So for me, it's just really focusing on the positive and saying, is, is this what I have time for? Is this the best use of my time? No. Okay. I'm going to move on. Yeah. Well, Gary, as an author, there's always um, a new mountain to climb, a new thing that God's stirring in your heart. What's something right now, uh, maybe that you're writing about or going to start writing about, something that's just kind of like 
churning in your soul. Uh, and uh, I'll say Thomas, who runs our podcast. What was the, what was the line you used? Remember the, the line you used when we were... Uh, What's your muse? What's your muse? That's the, that would be my t- t- Thomas, who's a, who's a, a great gifted artist. Uh, Gary, what's your muse? What is it that's turning around inside your mind right well, now? Well, it's sort of the opposite of what we're talking about: living by God affirmation. Hmm. Uh, I interviewed this pastor in Fontana, California. I don't know if you know Dan Carroll, Water of Life, large have, yeah. church down there. I mean, you know, Fontana is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You don't get there by accident. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but. He talked about just this terrible story of a dysfunctional family where his mom was deeply troubled and told him, I never even wanted you to be born. I mean, imagine mm-hmm. a mom. And so he went through military school and he was like, and he just grew up so angry. And then God reached him in a miraculous way. So he grew up so insecure and he grew up so angry. And Kevin, if I met him today, the one word I would use to describe him is gentle mm. and calm and wise and secure. Mm. And, and somebody asked him, how do you get up in front of these large churches all the time and, and, and speak? And he finally said, well, I figured if I'm good enough for God, I'm good enough for them. Because he had this one conversation where he said, God, my mom didn't even want me to be born. My own mom said, you should not be born. And he said, Gary, God told me, that's right, but I wanted you to be born. I've chosen you. I've created you. Is that enough for you? Yeah. And that changed his perspective. Yeah. And Kevin, I think if we can live out of God affirmation, mm-hmm. your spouse doesn't get to define whether you're a good spouse. Mm-hmm. Are you loving them the way that pleases God? Your kids don't yeah. get to decide if you're the best parent. Yeah. Uh, you're a pastor. Your congregation doesn't get to decide if you're being faithful. Um, Richard Baxter got fired <laughs> from preaching at a church. John Calvin got fired mm-hmm. from preaching at a, I mean, some of the greats of the Christian yeah. faith were fired. And, but that didn't define them yeah. because they learned to live by God affirmation. Mm-hmm. And so um, for me, I, I know that phrase, good enough for God. Well, nobody's good enough for God. That's not what Dan's saying. Of course, yeah. we're not in Christ. The thing is, once God has accepted us, we can say, I'm, God views me as good enough to be his child because of what Jesus did. Mm-hmm. And so I'm free yeah. from the opinion of others. And if we want to walk away from toxic people, we need that because yeah. they'll, they'll say, oh, you're the worst mom ever. You're the worst friend ever. You weren't there for me as a child. You weren't mm. there for me as a parent. And, and they'll use that to keep reeling us back in. Yeah. Godfather yeah. too. I think I'm out. And they keep reeling me back yeah, in. Yeah. <laughs> um, it, it's God affirmation, living yeah. out of God's acceptance that yeah. will free us from that. Yeah, and what a what a life giving, you know, peace growing, positive way to live your life. So, well, then, then I encourage those that are listening to pray that God will bring about that those thoughts in such a way that you can share it with the church as you do so many other things that come to your heart. So, final thing, uh, if you look over here at, at these cameras and at, at Thomas Kubicki, tell us how can people get a hold of you, learn about you. Uh, social media, online. How do people get more connected with the ministry you're doing? Yeah, thank you. Well, I've got two areas, primarily my website, which is just my name, GaryThomas.com. You can look at books or whatnot. Where I'm interacting most is on Substack. Um, It's GaryThomasBooks.Substack.com. And that's where I have three posts that come out a week. I post videos and interviews with people. Kevin and Sherry are going to be one uh, coming up uh, in future days. So, um, Love to see him there. Great. Well, thank you for joining us. And uh, I hope and pray uh, that all, all those that are listening uh, will be encouraged to have a healthier, better life in Christ as you identify and address and deal with the toxicity that's out there. And maybe something's turned in your own soul. And you thought, maybe, well, you know what? Maybe in this relationship, I'm the one who's becoming a bit toxic, that God will speak to your heart as well. But blessings. And we we'll look forward to seeing you in our next podcast. Whether you're watching on YouTube or listening on your podcast app, make sure to subscribe to hear more. We'll see you next time.